This week on Life and Faith. White supremacy is still alive and well in our society. And we're seeing its uh, recrudescence in some very serious ways currently in the political scene. Uh, the notion that this is a white country is one that is demographically doomed. That won't pass without, uh, without some uh, strong reactions on the part of uh, white people who want to bring back America the Great. We have entered into an amusing ourselves to death moment in history. It doesn't make sense to me. If there is God, God's supposed to be free. I was 100% sure that I was sacrificing on the altar of truth my only chance for happiness in this world. Miracles don't necessarily change anybody's mind. They just get their attention. And so I had to run with my child on my back, the ESA army coming behind us. I said, gee, Uncle George, this is luxurious for a communist. <laughs> Sonny said nothing's too good for the worker, nothing. Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. It's good to be with you. Well, this week we thought we'd pause our schedule to repeat an episode from a couple of years ago. It's called The Long Shadow of Slavery. And we thought given the events of recent weeks, the death of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests all over the US and around the world, including here in Australia, that this would be the right episode to revisit. As you'll hear, when we first posted it, we were reflecting on the death of black teenager Trayvon Martin at the hands of George Zimmerman and the fallout from that tragedy. Well, sadly, here we are in 2020 and it seems not much has changed. Might we, though, be on the cusp of something shifting? Well, let's hope so. The interview you're about to hear comes from our documentary, For the Love of God, How the Church is Better and Worse Than You Ever Imagined. It features Professor Albert J. Roberto from Princeton University. He's an expert in the African-American religious experience. We asked him to walk us through the history of race relations in the U.S. and the deep roots of racial division from the plantations to the Black Lives Matter movement today. The subject is not only topical, but it's a deeply personal one for him. So here it is. It's a shorter episode than usual. But I think, like us, you'll appreciate and be moved by Albert Roberto and his story. On the 26th of February back in 2012, Trayvon Martin, who was visiting his dad in Sanford, Florida, decided to head out to a nearby 7-Eleven. He picked up a packet of Skittles and an iced tea, and on the way back, he was spotted by a neighbourhood watch captain, George Zimmerman, who called 911 to report a, quote, real suspicious guy. What happened next was tragic, almost unbelievable. The unarmed black teenager, he was only 17 years old at the time, was confronted, shot and killed by George Zimmerman. Trayvon Martin's death and later the fact that a Florida jury found Zimmerman not guilty of Martin's death sparked national outrage and reignited the debate on racial profiling and civil rights. Just a couple of years later, in 2014, Michael Brown, an unarmed black man, was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri, by a white police officer. Watching the reaction to that unfold, even from a distance, it became very clear that despite the election, twice, of an African-American president, racial tensions in the US were far from being overcome. United we be, ceasing all this fire. This violence, discrimination, we will be free. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! And there's something about all this, a white man shooting and killing a black man, then getting away with it. Police brutality, the protests, that's reminiscent of the civil rights movement back in the 50s and 60s. And when I spoke to an expert about this, he made it very clear that while some things have changed race relations in the U.S. remain deeply problematic. The term I, I tend to use is the long shadow of the plantation. We still this is Professor Albert J. Roberto from Princeton University. He's an expert in the African-American religious experience and the history of slavery and civil rights in the U.S. So that, as uh, historian Edmund Morgan says, 
the story of American history has been uh, a kind of counterpoise between American slavery and American freedom. Indeed, freedoms have been spread to a larger group of people over time, but that spread has been at the cost of the ongoing uh, oppression uh, of, of black people um, in uh, ways that have become very apparent you know, thanks to video cams and cell phones um, that uh, betray uh, the brutality of the police state that we uh, sometimes live in as black people. The recent presidential election was even more revealing. White supremacy is still alive and well in our society. And we're seeing its uh, recrudescence in some very serious ways currently in the political scene. Uh, the notion that this is a white country uh, is one that is demographically doomed, but uh, it won't go, uh, that won't pass without, uh, without some uh, uh, strong reactions on the part of uh, white people who want to bring back uh, America the Great. Race relations in America are as complex as ever. So we asked Professor Roberto to guide us through some of the key moments of the civil rights movement and how it continues to impact and influence American society and culture today. Yeah, it was a real honor to do this interview, not only because he's an expert in all this, but he's actually lived the civil rights movement. It's personal for him. My father was killed by a white man in Mississippi uh, three months before I was born. And the white man who killed him was, uh, was never uh, tried. Uh, he claimed self-defense and uh, he wasn't uh, indicted even. Um, and uh, when I was growing up, I knew that my father was, was dead. My mother and stepfather raised me. But they didn't talk about uh, the circumstance of my father's death. I didn't indeed uh, find out uh, about it, much about it until I went back to Mississippi when I was 50 years old to investigate. And um, when I was uh, 17 and getting ready to go off to college, they sat me down and for the first time explained to me what had happened. And um, they uh, said, the reason we didn't tell you before this was we didn't want you to grow up hating white people. Now, I had two responses to that. One was I was glad that they told me. The second response was, what kind of country is it that we live in when you can't tell a child why his father was killed because you didn't want him to grow up hating white people? It was because of this, because his father was killed, that his mother moved the family from the South to the Midwest. And it took him quite a while before he returned to Mississippi to find out what really happened. But when I went back when I was 50, um, I talked to some of my uh, relatives about it. Most of them didn't want to talk about it, but a few did. And um, I went to the uh, uh, police department in uh, Bay St. Louis, the town I was born in, and found the uh, uh, record uh, of... Uh, the murder of my father. And one of the policemen said that uh, he had heard that the son of the man who had murdered my father lived in a close by town. So I found his uh, name in the phone book and I called him up and I said, uh, um, out of the blue, uh, um, I'm uh, the son of uh, Albert Rabato, whom your father killed. And I'd like to know what your family's version of that story is. And he said, oh yes. He paused a minute and he said, yes. Uh, I was nine years old when that happened, so I remember your father. and uh, I remember him as a big burly man, and he and my father fought, and my, my father pulled a gun in self-defense and shot him. Well, I have a picture of my father standing between my two sisters. One was 11, one was 13. He's very, barely taller than my 11-year-old sister. It was, uh, a, his build was like mine. He was very slender. And, and so he was not a, not a burly man. And uh, so I didn't challenge him about that, but I did say, what happened to your father? And I said, he said, uh, he came down with terminal cancer and he shot and killed himself. And I was very tempted to say, did he use the same gun as he did when he, when he got shot my father? But I thought that would have been cruel, so I didn't. Roberto didn't get angry. He didn't hate the man who killed his father. And he told me that because he didn't know about how his father died, his mother actually succeeded in raising him as a man who didn't hate white people. 
but he did carry a particularly painful scar from this. He didn't have a sense of who his father was. After that conversation, I visited my father's grave, and I had been there many times over the years. But for the first time, I began to cry, and um, it was as if in my mind's eye I saw him. I saw him getting shot, and I saw him falling, and it was as if he was falling into my arms and into my life, and, um, and it was as if a father and son had finally met. Mm. And um, then I bent down and I picked some dirt up from his grave and I rubbed it on my forehead, which uh, I later learned was a very African gesture. And uh, then I walked away. One of the really devastating things about this story, though, is that it's a story that's repeated throughout Black American history. The senseless, brutal death of a father or mother, brother or sister, daughter or son. And it's all too familiar for so many African-American families and communities. But what's also familiar is this sort of response, this idea that violence can't be fought with more violence. Hatred can't be fought with more hatred. One night when the Montgomery bus boycott had gotten started, uh, he received a uh, telephone call. And uh, uh, it was a threat from someone who said that... uh, he was going to be killed, his family was going to be killed, his house was going to be bombed. And uh, he just, you know, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Roberto's talking about Martin Luther King here and the roots of his philosophy of nonviolence. King was influenced by people like Gandhi and Thoreau, but by far the biggest influence for him was Jesus. King took his cues from his father, his grandfather and great-grandfather. They were preachers and activists. And it was important for him that black social justice would emerge from the black church. A deeply personal, spiritual epiphany was a key marker as well. He just sat down at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee and said uh, a prayer, which basically was, uh, Lord, I'm down here trying to do good, but I'm losing my courage, and I can't let others see me losing my courage because um, then they will will lose their lose their their uh, will to fight this fight. And I uh, said he heard a voice speaking to him, saying, uh, "Martin Luther King, uh, stand up for what's right, stand up for justice, and I will never abandon you. I will never leave you. I'll never leave you alone. I'll never leave you alone." And for King, that kitchen table experience became for him the rock solid basis for his activism, even though he knew uh, as his life went on and on that he was not going to die in bed. Nonviolence wasn't just a tactic for King, it was his way of life. It was a way of life that reflected um, the creator in whose image and likeness all of us were made. And so for him, uh, nonviolence respected um, the divine image within each person. Um, now, not everyone was nonviolent in the civil rights movement. And people who were nonviolent often didn't uh, believe in nonviolence as a way of life, but viewed it more as a political tactic. So Fannie Lou Hamer, for example, uh, had seven guns in her house, just in case, or as one uh, and one uh, uh, tenant farmer put it, this nonviolence can get you killed. Um, so for many people, it was seen as a political tactic, uh, not as a way of life. But for King and many of his followers, it was seen as a way of life that is in, that is in consonance with um, the image of God within all of God's creatures. There is a, a deep root, I think, in, in the African-American community that has always appreciated that hate restored uh, or inspired uh, as a way of attacking hate (laughs) is a no-win situation. And that hate and even resentment, um, as King and others taught, leads to the corrosion of uh, the individual uh, person's own humanity. It just doesn't attack the other, uh, but it attacks and has an effect upon uh, the individual. 
You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. Albert Roberto, Professor of Religion at Princeton University, is guiding us through some of the key moments in the civil rights movement. And we're pausing at some deeply personal moments on the way. Like this time when he was a kid taking piano lessons from a white woman in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he grew up. It was around the time of the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. The governor had mobilized the National Guard to try and stop nine African-American students from integrating into the high school. One day uh, we had finished the lesson and she turned to me and she said, I want to apologize to you. You know, I'm seven or eight years old. I said, for what? She said, for what uh, my people are doing in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. That's the effect of people actually seeing um, and empathizing with the sufferings of others. Eventually, President Eisenhower managed to bring an end to the crisis by removing the National Guard from the governor's control, and he ordered 1,000 American troops to oversee the integration. Those nine African-American students entered the school in September 1957, and eight completed the school year, but they also faced constant discrimination from other students. And this is a recurring theme in the civil rights movement. There are wins, but they come with incredible struggle, pain, and tremendous sacrifice. One of the most powerful examples of this was Bloody Sunday. In 1965, during a round of nonviolent protests in Selma, Alabama, a state trooper shot Jimmy Lee Jackson, a 26-year-old black church deacon. He died eight days later. The protesters took to the streets once again and made their way through Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where they faced a blockade of state troopers and police. When the crowd tried to press on, they were attacked. So when uh, the beating at the the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, was shown on television, it interrupted on uh, on, uh, uh, one one of the major networks a showing of the movie Judgment at Nuremberg. You know how fitting, mm-hmm. and um, the uh, the beating was was shown and and moved to Birmingham. When people see images, pictures, or live images of the water cannons turned on children, uh, or the police dogs, you know, biting uh, unarmed protesters, um, what happens is people says, "Is this America? How can this happen?" <laughs> You know, and then, um, you know, what can be done about it? So these iconic moments were important in terms of creating um, an awareness of the ongoing evil of racism and showing how it has, um, it calls into question our our national identity, the notion of our exceptionalism. Uh, Yeah, America's exceptional, all right. It beats beats its black people. Uh, It sends police dogs to attack uh, unarmed uh, demonstrators and water cannons to knock over uh, uh, children. So to to see the, what's going on um, stirs up the conscience and creates uh, the possibility of a movement for change. We actually did some filming in Alabama on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And, you know, 50 years on from Bloody Sunday, it was pretty eerie. And with the current state of race relations, the Black Lives Matter movement, and one of the most divisive presidential elections happening at the time that we were filming there, I just got a real sense of how, when it comes to civil rights, there's a lot that's happened, but obviously there's a long way to go. I took a group of uh, students, both undergraduate and graduate students, and some alumni on a civil rights tour. And one of the places that we went was Selma, and uh, Joanne Bland, uh, a woman who was beaten as a child on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, runs a civil rights museum right at the foot of the bridge. And uh, on the wall, she showed us a, uh, a card that had been sent by one of the uh, white troopers who had beat her and others on the bridge, apologizing, saying that he repented for what he had done, regretted it, and. Uh, wanted to uh, express his sorrow. Um, And then one of the older alumni who was along with us in his 70s uh, had arthritis. He had been down to march in Selma. And um, he told her that uh, he had been one of the marchers. 
And she uh, gave him a big hug and, and said how important it was to them that, that, um, that white people came so that they knew they were not alone. They knew that the nation knew about them. And uh, they both started crying and they hugged each other and the rest of us started crying as well. So after, th after that, um, the group was gonna walk across the bridge. And I, uh, I got out, I thought, I don't need to walk across the bridge. I've already seen the bridge in terms of these two people um, hugging each other, one who was beaten and one who came to bear witness to the injustice of that beating. Uh, so for me, I, I had already crossed the bridge. This has been Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart, and Natasha Moore. If you're enjoying this content, please do leave us a rating or review. It helps get the word out and also tell your friends to jump on to Life and Faith. Well, we're working hard to contribute to a positive conversation about faith, meaning, the big questions of life. Everything we produce here at CPX seeks to do that, and it's all made possible by supporters who donate to us. We'd really love you to consider doing just that. Every bit counts. Go to lifeandfaithpodcast.com to find out more. Next week. People want to set themselves apart from the evil that has existed in the world and exists now, the sadness, all of it. They act as if it were all some terrible error made by other people that they themselves are not vulnerable to making. I think real humanism depends on taking the whole history of humankind, which is really something, really a difficult thing. But at the same time, we have to look with pity and we have to look with recognition on all the generations that have come before us and, and you know, understand that we are as blind as they are. Mm -hmm.